Hello, NCTM audience. We wish that we could be with you in person, but we're grateful for the opportunity to create a video for you. Um, as a team that's never created a pre-recorded video, we really want to keep you engaged. We know we had a workshop plan, so there'll be times later where we ask you to pause your video and engage with our materials or to think about something more deeply. So we hope we can still engage you in part of that process through this alternative means for conferencing. Um, and I'll start us off today, but you will also meet Mike Belcher and Josh Mannix along the way. Josh is going to take you through um, the beginning of our materials, and then Mike will finish um, and then talk about some practical things for implementing our challenges in your own classrooms. Um, we're grateful for the support of NSF um, to fund this work and the visionary ideas of Jer Comfrey, who was the former principal investigator on this grant, but she recently retired. So we hope she's off having fun. Okay, so we really care a lot about mathematics um, and we were thinking about ways to engage students more deeply in math and um, created a project where they engage in entrepreneurship to tackle real problems. So if we think about problems that are occurring right now, we just in the last year have seen some extreme weather in Texas. We know the COVID pandemic is a hot topic and there continue to be hurricane strikes all up and down the East Coast. So um, the map in the middle is a heat map. There's a special thermometer that has Bluetooth capabilities. And um, that's a map of two weeks before COVID hotspots started happening. So you can see that there's a hot spot in Texas and then in Southern California. Um, so you could predict these waves in real time. Um, really cool thermometer. Um, students that we work with care a lot about the needs of their communities. Um, so as we think about that cold weather in Texas, um, how could we innovate solutions to help um, the homeless population stay warm or to provide power to people without electricity for extended periods of time? or even how to keep drinking water safe. Um, with hurricanes, how do we deliver medical supplies um, to people in rural areas when they've been wiped out with flooding? Um, so we think that there's a lot of really interesting context that innovation um, could help us solve some problems. Okay, so why entrepreneurship? In our materials, we have three mentor videos and um, we're gonna watch a part of one of them. You hear a lot of talk about diversity, and usually that's assigned to like the color of someone's skin. That's a form of diversity, but there's also the diversity of thought. We have to surround ourselves with people who are different than us and have different viewpoints so we can create more value. Thinking about diverse populations, I'm talking about diverse populations, I can know what's closest to me. That's Black and Latino populations. You know there's unfair pay. You know there's unfair treatment inside of work environments. If you're affected by the inequality in your job, or you're being underserved in the marketplace with the products that people have created for you, you just leave that marketplace. Like the, Once you leave, the, that construct is over. Because now you're going to go get your own money. You can go charge your own rates. And when you go create your own, you're creating a whole new environment, a new culture that you can make reflect what you think is interesting and healthy. Well, you know what your, your community wants and your culture wants. Turn that into a product. Build it yourself. You have the option. I think that the approach to starting businesses is fairly simple. You have to be solving for a problem that is big enough that can generate enough returns so you can pay yourself and you can pay other people. If you have an idea now as a young entrepreneur, the best thing to do is to get it in front of other people. Nothing exists that has not gone through a process where somebody had an idea, they got input on that idea, and then they had to change that idea to optimize it. Like every single thing you see is just a thought manifested. Somebody had a creative idea, and they figured out how to manifest it. And you can do that, too. And we all have the power to create enterprise, so long as we harness our creativity and put the work in to do it. Okay, so that's our mentor, Talib Graves' man. Um, he was tired of his baseball hat getting squashed on airplanes. So created a really cool sky cap um, to kind of have a little piece of luggage for your baseball hat. Um, so he, he markets that and sells it. 
Um, so the idea of being an entrepreneur is finding a problem and then innovating to find a solution. When he talked about having an idea, putting it in front of people, revising it and iterating it, that's a lot how um, we think of math, right? We're gonna solve this problem. We might have bumps and blocks along the way, but we're gonna work and persevere, get feedback and then improve the idea. So we come up with a solution. Um, but we feel like entrepreneurship is an exciting way to engage students and they get to think about um, solutions that are meaningful to them and meaningful to their communities. Um, and then they get to go and identify the resources and figure out the problem. Okay, so here's some student views on what it means to be an entrepreneur from some of our in-house piloting of our materials. Is someone who, who takes an idea and uses it to their own advantage, but also other people's advantages. I think it, they can, they are problem solvers, but they actually put, put in action, they actually take action and do stuff with those ideas that they have and they use it to, for the greater good and also for themselves. Okay, so that's here in student's voice about having an idea, finding a problem, and it, it's mutually beneficial to you and to your customers. It's someone who... Okay, so here's our entrepreneurial framework. And on the inside, we're trying to elicit um, these um, entrepreneurial processes. So students come up with an idea for a problem, they go seek out different resources and learn more about it. Um, through that, they're working with their team to create a prototype. They might conduct some market research um, Then they iterate that design to improve it based on the things they're learning. They have some business structure um, so that they could actually, I mean, they don't sell it in our materials, but so that they think about the business and who their customers are. And then they pitch it to a panel of judges. So we engage students in all of those entrepreneurial processes on the inside. And then we elicit the characteristics of entrepreneurship that you see on the outside, persistence, creativity, problem solving, adaptability. And um, as mathematics educators, we also view those as important um, in the math classroom, right? Persistence. We want them to be creative and problem solve, um, use their resources to their advantage and have a lot of courage in sharing those ideas. Okay, so what actually is the design and pitch challenges in STEM? So if you scan that QR code, it'll take you to our website where all of our materials are always freely available to you um, and at your disposal. Um, but I wanna run you through a few things. Um, so the goals of our project are to merge entrepreneurship and mathematics. And we wanted to be really intentional on eliciting um, rigorous mathematics for students. So um, we develop challenges that are open enough to allow students to be innovative and bring in the expertise they have from their um, out of school knowledge. Um, and you'll see we have challenge statements and we really draw out specific mathematics that we want them to focus on in the design of their solutions. Um, and then we try to motivate them to learn new STEM content, but really focus on the math. And we'll present you an example, well, Josh will, um, in a few minutes. So you can really have a vision for how we do this. And I think it's really cool. We kind of did not know where to go when COVID hit a year ago. So we designed a virtual pitch competition where students across the United States submit their pitches and, um, they can win gift cards and um, certificates. So we're trying to um, adapt to this more virtual model of instruction that we've seen lately. Okay, so we have nine challenges. They span a variety of topics and um, are aligned to middle school math standards. Um, the first is Operation Lifeline. So this is when a disaster happens, how do you actually get medical packs to people that are in need? So students have to innovate and think about um, volume in that particular challenge. Electric cars are becoming more and more popular. In Power Me Up, students have to think about where they could place charging stations for electric vehicles so that they have enough customers and so that the customers can drive certain distances on a charge. Have you ever heard of fubbing? 
in Keep It Real, students tackle fubbing, which is phone snubbing, um, where uh, someone might be on their phone and totally ignoring the person next to them. So in Keep It Real, they explore data and representations to come up with an app that helps people start fubbing and keep it real with the people around them. The Building Algorithms Challenge has students rate or rank something that's of interest to them. Um, and Prototype to Profit, they pick from a list of new innovations and they think about the business model and the financial aspects that they'll need to bring that product alive. Um, we really wanted to have a challenge where they thought about that financial math so that that didn't overwhelm all of the challenges. Um, the United States throws away so much fresh produce every single year. So in a race food waste, students innovate a business to figure out how to deal with what we're calling ugly foods. So foods that are still very edible, still have a long life left, but might not be the prettiest. Um, so they come up with a way to um, sell that food. Um, in Fix It Design for Community Impact, we were hearing from students, um, local middle school students when we talked, that they really cared about ideas in their community. So in Fix It, they create a prototype for a 3D solution to a problem in their local community. So they really get to think hard about the needs of their community, and then um, they innovate a design to solve that need, and they have to think about how they'll ship it and package it um, for consumers. Flashy fashion, there is some really cool new technology where you can embed LED lights into clothing. So in flashy fashion, they create a wearable technology that students could have an app on their phone and then program the lights to change. Um, so you might have one design and then you program it and you have another design. So that one's really neat. Um, the world is also becoming um, overwhelmed by plastic waste. So there's a cool new technology where you can encapsulate a liquid um, in a biodegradable case. So students have to create a business around reducing plastic by um, storing a liquid in this um, biodegradable plastic. So those are the nine challenges. Along with each challenge, we have a challenge champion. And then we have um, three mentor videos. We have um, Heather Ames um, and Talib Graves Man, And we also have an animated one that we created a script for that teaches kids an overview of entrepreneurship. Um, but these challenge champions um, are a diverse group of scientists, community leaders, and entrepreneurs. There's one associated with each task, and they have a video that introduces each task, and then a background video that provides students with more information. Um, for Operation Lifeline, we have a scientist from the United States Geological Survey. Uh, we have a chemical engineer from Tesla for Power Me Up. Um, Cardello Patillo is a executive director of Mile High Kids. Um, so he really helped situate the fubbing um, for students. We have Kathy Yi, who's CEO of Incluvi, a brand new um, website that um, rates the diversity of movies. Um, Tyler Maloney, is the challenge champion for prototype to profit. We have um, someone who has really innovated some of the food um, in Africa, um, Oscar Ecamino, that is our challenge champion for rice food waste. Jitanjali Rao, who I'll talk about um, in a minute. Um, Kelsey Dominic has done some really cool fashion stuff. So she launches the flashy fashion challenge. Um, and then for pollution solution, um, we have the founder of Kimalex um, from Kenya. And he, his work is focused on clean and sustainable energy, but he does a great job situating the pollution solution um, challenge. So Jitanjali Rao is our challenge champion for Fix It. Um, she, at 10 years old, got really discouraged by the Flint um, water crisis and um, 
innovated by the time she was 12. She was working with 3M and had manufactured this device um, called Tethys, um, which uses Bluetooth capabilities, a nine volt battery, and then can detect lead in drinking water. Um, all by the time she was 12. Uh, just this year, she's 15 now, um, she's Times Kid of the Year, um, and she is our challenge champion for Fix It. Um, I really like this quote. She says, I think being a scientist is like being a superhero because superheroes save people and I want to do what is best for their society. Scientists do the same exact thing. Um, and we've heard a lot about how kids want to improve the world and improve their communities. Um, Jatanjali's doing it through science. Um, other kids will do it through art or math, but um, there's an entrepreneurship aspect of it. Um, that we like to harness as well. Um, so here's our framework. First, we want students to understand the challenge. Um, so we have a video that introduces students to the challenge and we have a challenge statement. And then they go into learning more about the background of a particular challenge. And then they go into this iterative stage where they research and they design and they prototype. They think about what kind of business plan they'll have and how they might market it. And then they complete a tech brief, which is kind of like a, the science backing for their innovation. Um, so they do that third um, aqua row iteratively and together um, and through lots of cycles of refinement. And then they prepare and practice their pitch. Um, it's also possible that they get feedback on their pitch before they actually deliver it. So then at the end of the challenge, they deliver the pitch um, to a panel of judges um, and everybody celebrates. Um, so we're going to take you through each of those steps of the process. Um, so I'll turn it off to Josh. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm JP. At this point, we want you to experience the DMP process as your students might. As such, we're gonna walk you through each step in the process. A few times throughout, we'll stop to allow you to explore the website and try to develop your own solutions. Let's go ahead and jump right in. First things first, we need to make sure that we understand the challenge. As Aaron mentioned earlier, we will be using Fix It as an example as we walk through this process. Each DNP challenge begins with a challenge statement, which you'll find on the launch page of the challenge website. This document is a list of all the components that are required to successfully complete the challenge. Each challenge also includes a video version of the challenge statement in which the challenge champion sets the stage for the challenge and explains that document. As you heard earlier, our Fix-It Challenge champion, Gitanjali Rao, decided to tackle the issue of polluted water after hearing about the crisis in Flint, Michigan. It's this type of ingenuity that students will strive to unlock in the Fix-It Challenge. In order to address whatever local issues students choose to look at, they will, look, they will work to design a product that helps community members address or solve that issue. Let's watch as Gitanjali introduces us to the Fix-It Challenge Statement. My name is Gitanjali Rao, and at 11 years old, I was named America's Top Young Scientist after I invented a device that detects lead in drinking water. For me, this was more than a science fair project. I recognized a critical problem faced by millions of people around the world, and I worked to create a solution. Contaminated drinking water is just one example of a real world problem that needs to be solved. If you look around in your own communities, you'll notice the other issues that need fixing or improving. Why wait for someone else to make things better or take the risk that nobody even tries? Entrepreneurs and innovators don't sit on the sidelines when they find a problem. They get to work. And you can take it from me, there is no age requirement for good ideas. Anyone, no matter how young, can make a real impact by identifying, understanding, and taking action to solve real world problems. So are you up to the challenge? Your challenge is to design a physical product that will help solve a problem facing your community. You should conduct research that shows the product helps solve the problem. Prototype your solution. This should be a 2D sketch or a 3D model, and also include the dimensions of the product and a description of the materials needed. 
and describe how the product will be distributed to customers, including the volume and surface area of the shipping container. You'll find more background information and details on the challenge in the supporting resources. Good luck. As Gatanjali outlined, students will be working on designing a product and creating a sketch or a model of their solution. They'll also need to describe the shipping container for their product. Outside of the standards outlined by our champion and available in the challenge, challenge statement document, students are free to explore whatever issue piques their interest. On the right side of the screen, you can see a screenshot of the challenge statement as it's posted on the website. At the bottom, we include a blurb about technology in this challenge. While students are encouraged to use Tinkercad to draft their 3D model, if they choose to do so, they are not required to actually print their solution. We really want the DMP challenges to be accessible to all students, and we understand that many students and schools simply don't have those kinds of resources. We do include tutorials on Tinkercad, though, and we encourage students to explore this tech tool. Students are encouraged to refer to the challenge statement throughout the process in order to ensure that they're addressing each of the components adequately. Each challenge is also aligned with specific Common Core math standards. For Fixit, the targeted concepts come primarily from the number sense and computation and geometry dimensions. Students who successfully complete this challenge will develop proportional reasoning skills, investigate concepts related to scale and transformations, and measure various characteristics of 3D figures, including surface area and volume. Proportional reasoning and scale really come out when the students begin sketching and designing their product, while the various characteristics of 3D figures will develop as they describe their shipping containers. Once students have a chance to hear the challenge statement, it's time for them to learn more about the challenge context and begin developing their solutions. In order to help them get a grasp on the context of the challenge, we've compiled a list of helpful items on the prepare page of each challenge website. Here, you will find a variety of resources and tools that students can use to help them develop their solutions. The first resource on each page is a second video from the challenge champion. For Fix It, the prepare page contains a second video message from Gitanjali that explains more about the issues facing our world and how she got the inspiration for her product. She also explains the resources, resources that she used along the way. This video really demonstrates the creative process behind entrepreneurship, and we hope that it'll motivate students to think outside the box as they work on their solutions. Below the video, there are links to websites, articles, other videos, and more to help students understand how to identify problems and build and package their solutions. For this challenge, there are two additional sections as well, math resources and tools and tech tools. Throughout the DNP challenges, we include these resources when there's a specific math or a tech tool that students might find helpful in their design process. In this case, the math resource provides some information on surface area and nets. This worksheet style resource will help students as they work to develop their shipping container. The tech tool for Fixit is Tinkercad, a program that students can use to draft a 3D model of their solution. This website's engaging, and let's face it, it's just plain fun. And we've included several tutorials in, and a how-to guide to help students if they have never used Tinkercad before because there is a bit of a learning curve. All right, now that we've talked to you for a little while, it's time for you to try this out for yourselves. In just a second, I'm going to ask you to pause your video and take some time to do a couple of things. First, scan that QR code there, which will take you to the prepare page of the Fix It Challenge. If you've not been to the DMP website yet, go ahead and take a minute and explore. When you're ready, try to brainstorm an issue facing your community and think about one possible solution that might help. Then put on your teacher hat and consider how you might use these resources with your students. All right, go ahead and pause your video now. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you were able to think about an issue or two that you could help solve in your community and even a solution to one or both of those problems. If not, these resources might help you develop or solidify your thinking and that's one way that we hope you might be able to use these tools with your students. Once students have begun designing their solution, the next part of the DMP process is to develop the key business proposition. 
Of course, it's not enough to design a product. You have to be able to sell that product and get investors involved. This is where the key business proposition comes into play. One of several key documents on the Engage page of the Challenge website, the key business proposition challenges students to really dig into their idea. The circular diagram on the left of the screen asks students to consider four aspects of the solution. At the top, describe what the product is. At the bottom, describe who your customers are and what do they do. On the left, what do customers currently dislike about the problem or solutions that already exist? And how will this product address those complaints? And on, four on the right, what things do people like about current solutions that your product will take and make even better? Students also need to select a business model that they want to use as they build their business. On the Engage page, we provide a list of common business models to help students make this decision. By considering their product from these various perspectives, students are more likely to develop a comprehensive solution that adequately addresses the various components of that challenge statement. It also helps them prepare to pitch their ideas to investors, which is where the elevator pitch script on the right side of the screen comes into play. Students often need some help figuring out the difference in a pitch and a presentation. Then filling out the elevator pitch template will help them to see the crucial aspects of a pitch. The key component of the elevator pitch is that it focuses students' attention on how the product is better than the competitors and why investors should invest in their product instead of another. It also encourages students to be precise and efficient. As we'll discuss later, the final pitch can be no more than five minutes, so students need to be effective, efficient communicators. Of course, the elevator pitch is just a starting point. Students will need to add a lot more before they are ready for their final pitch. All right, it's your turn again. I'm going to ask you in just a minute to pause your video and try this out on your own. Go ahead and follow that QR code to the Engage page and open the business models and key business propositions documents. Try to think about which business model would be most effective for the solution that you began thinking about earlier. It doesn't have to be a business model on this list. These are just common types. Try to answer the questions in the key business proposition and begin building out your elevator pitch. All right, pause your video and give it a shot. All right, great. Hopefully you were able to build out a business that will support your goal of impacting your community. Like the key business proposition, the technical brief or tech brief is a critical document for the students to address. For you as a teacher, the tech brief is just one way for you to analyze and assess student thinking in the DNP challenges. We know that it's difficult, if not impossible, to be with each of your working groups every minute of every class. Even if you could, there's thinking that may not come out in every discussion or might happen, and hopefully will happen, outside of the classroom. The tech brief asks the important questions so that you can get a feel for these details and nuances. There are seven parts of each tech brief. The first six are the same for every challenge and cover a litany of prompts such as briefly describe your solution and describe the decisions you made to choose your design and the challenges you had to overcome. Part seven then addresses the challenge specific items. For fix it, these include a description of the community of interest, a justification for why the problem needs to be solved, the dimensions and description of the product, and the dimensions and description of the shipping container. This is also your chance to assess the math concepts that students engaged with throughout the process. If teachers assign a grade to the DMP challenge, they often use this tech brief as one of the components for that grade. To help you score the tech brief, we provide a rubric, which is also on the Engage page of the challenge website. The tech brief can be completed as students work, or after their final pitch, or a combination of both of those. Now, you're going to get to take a look at the text brief, tech brief for Fix It. In just a minute, I'll ask that you pause your video and follow that QR code back to the Engage page for Fix It. This time, scroll just a little further down the page and open the tech brief. How might you use this with your students? Why might it be important to ask these questions? You can also open the tech brief rubric and take a look at the scoring guide. Go ahead, pause your video, and take some time to think.
All right, hopefully you were able to see the importance of asking these questions to better understand the process students go through when completing a design and pitch challenge. Mike is now going to walk you through the last part of the process, pitching to investors. So I'm Mike, and I'm gonna talk about the last steps in the process, uh, convincing investors. So throughout this process, students are wrestling with two key concerns. How can I build a prototype that solves a challenge? And how can I do that in a way that works for real people? And through that negotiation, they arrive at their final solution. So on some level, students are thinking about how to convince investors throughout the entire process, but it all culminates with the final pitch to investors. So students have five minutes to pitch their solutions to the panel of judges. Uh, judges can be anyone, but they should not include the teacher. Uh, we've seen teachers use other school adults, which the students love, or members from the community, um, and we've even participated as judges ourselves. Having external judges ups the stakes for students and makes it so they can't assume the judges know anything about their product. And we think it's also important to not allow questions after the pitch. It forces students to be thorough and to practice so that they can get across all the important and relevant information. Before getting to the final pitch, we encourage teachers to have students run through a practice pitch with practice judges one to two days before the final pitch. Uh, the practice judges should also be external judges. And this practice pitch is important for a few reasons. First, it sets a firm deadline before the final pitch, which can get students moving if they're behind or have been lacking urgency. Uh, and it also ensures they have something to pitch. So that was something that I was always worried about when I was using PBL in my classroom. Uh, and the practice pitch helps address that. It makes sure that students have something and are ready to go on the day of the pitch. Uh, second, it's an opportunity for students to defend their solutions. Um, which they're excited to do. So by the time they get to this practice pitch, they know their products really well and they're invested. And so they're eager to talk about it and to defend it uh, when questioned. And lastly, it gives students a chance to experience pitching and to self-assess. Um, so what we've seen is that students don't know what they don't know until they do a practice pitch. It's a lot easier to explain your ideas to your teacher in a low stakes setting than it is to pitch to unfamiliar judges. And the practice pitch helps students find things to improve and it increases their confidence for the final pitch. Um, we've also included resources to help students learn how to pitch. So these resources include sample pitch decks, which are essentially PowerPoint slides uh, from companies like YouTube and Airbnb, uh, tips for organizing a pitch, and a scoring sheet that judges will use to evaluate the pitches. The idea is that students should know how their pitches are going to be judged before they start the pitch competition. So now you try. Pause your video and use the QR code to look at the pitch resources on our website. Think about how you would use these resources with your students and what they have to do with STEM learning. So what does the design and pitch challenge look like in a classroom? So our goal with the challenge is to make it so that they can be used in classrooms. And to that end, we built in a few implementation models and are adding new ones based on our conversations with teachers. Our typical six day model, which is shown on the slide, uh, includes a day zero <clears throat> during which a teacher would launch the competition, describe the components and discuss entrepreneurship. We call this a day zero because what we're seeing is that as teachers use the challenge, challenges, the students become more familiar with the model. Uh, this overview of entrepreneurship and the components becomes less necessary. Students start to understand what's expected of them. Uh, and you can jump into the challenge more quickly. But then we include benchmarks for the six days of the competition, which relate to the steps in the process. Um, we saw a really cool approach from a partner teacher where she took the components of that process and posted them on a board in her classroom and then had students work backwards from the end date to establish a benchmark for their work. Um, we also have an eight day model, which is obviously similar to the six day model, but with more time built in. Um, and we have a virtual model, uh, which I'm gonna talk about on the next slide. <clears throat> What we're also finding is that as we work with teachers, we're learning about other models teachers are using. And again, the goal is with the challenges, we want to be flexible enough to allow for those different models. Uh, and we'd like to learn about them when you do use them. So the virtual pitch competition. So currently we've been running virtual pitch competitions where we have teachers run a competition with their class and then submit pitches to us for a chance to win gift cards. So in this virtual model, teachers decide how much time to spend on a challenge. And so we did one in the fall of 2020. Teachers picked the challenges they wanted to complete and they implemented them in class as they would normally. They then submitted student pitches to us and we judged them and picked the top three for a top three live event over Zoom where we picked a grand prize winner. 
Um, we have a spring competition going on now that you can still join if you're interested and submissions are due May 6th. And so if you are interested in participating in the spring competition, please visit the QR code to sign up. On our website, we also have teacher resources and we're in the process of building these out. Um, currently, we have a standards alignment by challenge and a general description of the context and content of each challenge. And we're working on adding in tips for implementation. So if you end up using the challenges, we'd love to talk with you to see how we can improve our support. So why do we believe in design and pitch? And so what are we seeing as schools and students are using these? So the big thing is that the entrepreneurial processes, um, which you see in the center wheel, are driving engagement in math learning. And so we just highlight three of the key processes that, that we have seen as being key to this. <clears throat> so the first is opportunity and resource analysis, which just means identifying an entrepreneurial opportunity and assessing whether you have the resources to address it. So in practice, we've seen this come out as students leverage their unique interests and experiences to build solutions, which then empowers them as the experts. And this role as experts supports them to persist in building and defending their solutions. And that's from both a mathematical and an entrepreneurial perspective. So because they see themselves as uniquely qualified to address these entrepreneurial opportunities, um, they feel empowered and they feel excited to, to persist in building out their solutions. We also see that the consideration of business models helps students to see their work as authentic and actionable, which then creates a purpose for the math they're learning. Um, so they see their work as like the work being done by real and familiar companies, which makes them excited about it. And so they're seeing the math that they're learning as relevant and useful. And then lastly, the pitching. So pitching provides this appealing outlet for sharing and defending their work. Um, so students see pitching as something different than the typical presentations that they're used to. And they're really excited to share those unique solutions, which then leads them to continually practice and improve upon their solutions and pitch decks. So for them, they wanna make sure they're getting across their idea clearly and coherently um, because they're so excited and so proud about the work that they've done. So I wanted to show you uh, an example of a student pitch. This is from a different challenge, not fix it. This is from the building algorithms challenge. Um, and we wanna just, so you get an idea of what this looks like in practice. Uh, these are seventh and eighth graders and they built a company around an algorithm for rating Hispanic foods. So basically like for the spiciness, it was from one to 
time, what was like the most fun? She said, and how it's fun for some people might not like how some of the food smells. And then your serving size and your kids, and then you get a score, and it's around the 20s. Yay! 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 So these students were really excited about pitching their solution. Um, and what we think was what's really cool about it is that it was unique to the class, but it also incorporated their personal and out of school experiences. And the math, which um, here we were trying to get algebraic expressions and functions within a spreadsheet environment, uh, was embedded in that entrepreneurial solution. We're also hearing from teachers about how the challenges include more than just STEM skills. And we heard this one quote from one of our partner teachers. Um, she said, for me, one of the best things that came out of the call was actually one of my students talking about overcoming anxiety and being more confident speaking in front of his peers because of the projects. Y'all are making a more powerful difference than you realize and in more ways than just math. Um, and this is something we're seeing too. Early in the competition, students are anxious about pitching and presenting, and they talk about not liking public speaking and being afraid of public speaking. But by the end of the competition, they talk about how much they like pitching uh, and that they're excited to do it again. So being able to pitch something unique and be able to share something that they're proud of is giving them the confidence to go out and, and do this public speaking, um, which we view as a, a powerful outcome. So in conclusion, uh, we're seeing these challenges create opportunities for students to solve real world and authentic problems um, by decentering and considering the needs of users. So they become the experts and are able to decide for themselves whether solutions are correct because they are users of the product, uh, not just the designers. We also see that students are engaged and are taking ownership of their solutions. So they see their solutions as worth pursuing outside of school or the lab setting, and they're viewing it as, as actionable, as things that can actually work. Uh, lastly, through the challenge champions and these design challenges, we're seeing these uh, this framework is offering a flexible approach to introducing career connections in STEM, uh, specifically in math, by emphasizing the problem students want to solve first and then connecting those problems to real careers and showing how the math is embedded in solving those problems. So thank you for watching our presentation. Uh, we are continuing to research the challenges and are always looking for innovative and creative teachers who can help us improve the challenges and framework. Uh, if you have any questions or are interested in partnering with us, please contact us using the information on the slide shown here. Uh, thank you again, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.